Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 22 in our field supervision curriculum. And today we'll be discussing functional behavior assessment and functional analysis. So as a quick uh, thing to get started with, a quick point to make, when we talk about function, we are talking about the reason that an individual is engaging in a behavior. All behavior happens for a reason, uh, whether that's uh, socially accepted behaviors or overly adapted behaviors, all behavior has a function, all behavior serves a purpose for that individual. When we talk about trying to determine the function of a behavior, we are trying to understand what need that behavior is meeting for that individual. Functional behavior analysis, uh, functional behavior assessment and functional analysis are ways to try to figure out the function or the reason or the need that that behavior is meeting for a learner because not every individual is able to specifically explain why they engage in certain behaviors. Even individuals who have uh, fluent communication skills may not recognize why they engage in some behaviors. We may do things in our own life where we're like, I, I don't know why I do that. I just, I do it. I like it. I don't know. Right. So this is um, a way to help determine the function or the need that is being met for that individual, um, specifically because not everybody can explain why they engage in some behaviors. However, you can always start by asking because sometimes the individuals absolutely can tell you why they're engaging in a certain behavior and you should listen. Um, but these are going to be methods to help determine function if we are not uh, if, if the individual is not able to explain why they engage in a behavior. So first, we're going to start talking about functional behavior assessment. So functional behavior assessment is going to be a process, sort of a three-step process that is just a behavioral assessment to determine the function. Um, Again, when we're talking about determining function, we are really just trying to figure out what need that behavior is meeting for the individual. And that way we can then help meet the needs of the individual, support the individual in getting their needs met and manage the situation if overly adapted behavior occurs in a setting where it's, it's counterproductive. So uh, the first thing in a functional behavior assessment is indirect assessments. These are often interviews, and this is where the individual or people who are in the individual's environment are asked questions about why do you think this behavior is occurring? Um, when do you think it's most likely to occur? When is it least likely to occur? Again, we talked about just a minute ago that sometimes learners can tell you, individuals can tell you, oh yeah, I do this because this, and here's when I'm most likely to do it, and here's when I'm least likely to do it. But not everybody can tell you, even if they have the communication skills, they may not have the self-reflection ability to notice the patterns in their own behavior. But it doesn't hurt to ask. So asking questions. Oftentimes, indirect assessments take the form of those interviews. And they can be um, very uh, loose and um, naturalistic, I guess. Um, or they could be more structured. And in the online um, box folder, there are some examples, I believe, of functional uh, behavior assessment interviews uh, or functional assessment interviews. Um, questions may include when and where does the behavior occur? What happens right before the behavior? What happens right after? Is there a situation where the behavior always occurs? Are there any situations where the behavior never occurs? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing about interviews is that they are very quick and easy to administer, but the results are subjective and may not reflect 
what is actually going on for the learner. So my perspective on the situation might lead me to believe X, Y, Z, but that learner is actually responding to different things that maybe I'm not observing. So it's not a hundred percent, right? It's not proof. It's just people's hypotheses, but it's a great starting point. And from the information that you gather in an indirect assessment, you can plan your direct assessment. So we talk to somebody, we ask, what are the situations in which in which this is most likely to occur. So then we go and we observe during those times. Um, this is the descriptive assessment or direct observation. Um, one of the things that uh, sort of makes behavior analysis uh, different sometimes from maybe talk therapy or other um, therapeutic practices um, is that we do try to go and observe that behavior to see it in action. Because again, not everybody can report on exactly how or why they engage in something. So it's really good to look for patterns. Um, I have uh, experienced multiple examples where um, the people in the natural environment said, here's what we think's going on, um, but they want an outside observer to come in and kind of verify. And we look at things and we're like, oh, here's something that you guys missed because you're all busy teaching when this situation occurs. And here's the cue that the learner's responding to that you know they haven't been able to tell us. So you can catch different things by being an outside observer and you can maybe notice some different, um, different stimuli that a learner is responding to. I had a colleague who was able to um, put a camera and microphone on the bill of a hat that their learner wore because they were having a really hard time figuring out what some triggers were. And once they had that recording and they could see what that individual was seeing and they could hear the self-talk that the individual was engaging in, they were able to then better identify what the causes were because that individual was attending to different things in the environment than what the environment thought were the, the salient features. So direct observation, this descriptive analysis, this is where you're gonna go in, you're gonna observe, you're gonna describe the environment, you're gonna describe what happens before and what happens after. And you're gonna take that and you're gonna look for patterns. You're going to try to identify what might be going on for the individual. Now, descriptive analysis, uh, direct observation does take some time. Um, we don't want it to take too long. So, you know, you don't want to uh, try to take data for two, three, four weeks because during that time, the behavior is still um, occurring and the needs of the individual are not being met in the most efficient and effective way. So we don't want to string this out very long. If you have identified a behavior that does not occur very frequently, then maybe you look at smaller precursor behaviors that might suggest what the function would be of a more intense, less frequent event. Um, so you don't wanna drag your direct observation out very long. We want to try to um, get an occurrence or two uh, so that we can look and see if there are some patterns. Now, from both the indirect assessment and the direct uh, descriptive analysis, we just have hypotheses. We can say, here's what I think based upon the information that I have. We don't have proof. Um, in science, we try to have proof for things. We want to try to confirm things with, confirm our hypothesis with experiments. So a functional analysis is the experiment portion of a functional behavior assessment where you would confirm your hypothesis by presenting scenarios and taking data. Now, because we're talking about trying to confirm a hypothesis for what the function of a behavior is, this means that we are going to set up situations in which 
the behavior occurs and we respond to it in different ways to see which way is uh, more reinforcing, uh, which way occurs more often for that individual. Um, there is a traditional uh, format for the functional behavior assessment, and this is Iwata's uh, study. Um, and sometimes there's confusion that the way that Iwata did the um, study and determined the standard conditions for a functional analysis is the only way to do a functional analysis. And that is incorrect. There are lots of uh, literature articles and research extending um, the way we do functional analysis. There are also different methods. Um, Hanley's group with the, I think it's a practical functional assessment um, has a different methodology as well. And the overall goal of functional analysis is not that you do it one of these specific ways, but that you are presenting the opportunity for the behavior to occur and responding to it in different ways and counting, you know, which way is most likely for the behavior to continue to occur, which means which one is actually the reinforcer. So we're going to talk about the sort of traditional functional analysis um, from Iwata's article, um, but know that there are a lot of variations and that you should look into the functional analysis literature before you conduct a functional analysis so that you can select the best method for your learner, for your setting, for the implementers um, to determine the function in the most efficient and effective way uh, in order to help support the learner. All right, so in the traditional functional analysis, um, there were uh, conditions. Uh, there were four conditions that they tested, attention, demand, alone or ignore, and the play or control condition. So in an experiment, you have to have a control condition. You have to have um, basically a situation where you can turn off the behavior or a situation where the behavior never occurs. Now, there's a few situations where you might not be able to completely have the behavior not occur at all, but then that also tells us something. Um, and one would argue that if you can't have a control, if the behavior is always occurring, then you haven't figured out the function yet because the control condition is supposed to meet all of the needs of the learner. Give the learner their perfect environment and the behavior, the overly adapted behavior should not occur because all of their needs are being met. Um, so the control condition in the traditional functional analysis, um, the individual would be surrounded with items, um, activities that they can engage in, uh, and adults would be providing attention to them and playing with them, and there will be no demands presented. And the reason that they did this is so that the individual has something to do, they have attention, and there's no demands, because the other conditions that they tested involved giving attention or placing demands. There's also the alone or ignore condition. Um, the alone or ignore condition um, is to try to decide if the individual is engaging in behavior that is automatically reinforced, which means the occurrence of the behavior uh, produces the response, the, the reinforcer. Um, so if the individual would engage in these behaviors, even if no one's responding to them, even if there are no demands, even if they were left completely alone, then that suggests that it could be an automatic function. Now, if you remember, when we talked about functions of behavior, there's automatic, which means the behavior produces the reinforcer itself, 
and there's social, which means that the behavior results in a social change in the environment. Someone else has to deliver the reinforcer. Then there's positive and negative. Positive meaning we've added something to the environment, negative meaning we've removed something from the environment. The alone or ignore condition would only tell us automatic. It wouldn't tell us positive or negative. So we wouldn't know if this behavior is occurring. We wouldn't know whether or not it's occurring because the individual, um, the behavior is adding something to the individual's environment or because the behavior is removing something from the individual's environment. So more analysis would still be needed. However, it would suggest that it does not matter what people are doing in the environment and that it is something that the individual is experiencing maybe privately. Um, then we have the attention and the demand condition. So the attention condition, the setup was that uh, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> the adult pays a lot of attention. And then when the condition starts, the adult starts ignoring the individual. The adult does not provide any attention unless or until the individual engages in that targeted behavior. So if we were trying to determine the function of somebody clapping their hands, which I'm just going to use that example because it, it doesn't matter what the behavior is. But if we were trying to determine the function of someone clapping their hands, then in the attention condition, the individual uh, would be free to do whatever they wanted, but the adult or the implementer would completely ignore them no matter what they did until they clapped their hands. And then when they clapped their hands, the adult would provide attention. Now, the type of attention that the individual provides should be reflective of what the individual is likely to experience in the natural environment, which you would know from your interviews and your direct observation. So maybe it's positive attention. Yay, you clapped your hands. That's so good. Or maybe it's, you know, negative attention. No, stop clapping your hands. We're supposed to be quiet, right? Whatever it is, contingent upon the learner clapping their hands, then the instructor, implementer, adult in the situation would um, deliver that attention for a few seconds, then go back to ignoring. Now, you may be like, that's weird. Why would we deliver um, a, a consequence um, that might be reinforcing for somebody to engage in a behavior? And that's the point. The point is this is an experiment. We are going to set up opportunities for the behavior to occur, and then we're going to deliver a consequence that we think might be a function, which means we think it might be a reinforcer for the individual, and see if they do it more. So in the case of an attention condition, if my individual claps their hands and I give lots of praise, wow, that's so good, you clapped your hands, that's so cool, and they clap their hands again and I get more attention and they clap their hands some more and they just keep clapping their hands and I just keep praising them. We are tallying, we are taking data on the occurrences of hand clapping. And at the end of like a 15 minute uh, condition, 10 or 15 minute condition, um, I think the standard ones were 15, sorry. Um, then we would see how many times did the individual clap during this attention condition. Then we would compare that to the play or control condition and compare that to the alone or ignore condition and the demand condition if we ran all of these conditions. We'll talk about which conditions you run. Um, but we compare that. So they clapped a lot during the attention condition. Now let's see what would that look like during the demand condition. So in the demand condition, in the traditional functional analysis, um, work was presented or a demand was presented and there were repeated like prompts or instructions or the demand stayed present until the individual engaged in the targeted behavior. So in this case, maybe I put a math worksheet in front of the person and 
um, I leave it there and I prompt them to keep working on it until they clap their hands. And then if they clap their hands, then I'm going to remove the demands. I'm going to take the math worksheet away, or I'm going to say, okay, you can take a break. And I'm going to, you know, turn away from them and let them take a break. Um, again, with the idea that if we think that taking a break or stopping something or getting out of uh, having to do something is a reinforcer for this individual, then we're delivering it contingent upon the occurrence of the behavior, in our example, clapping their hands, and we're going to count how many times do they clap their hands. So they'd remove the demand for a few seconds, then they'd put it back, and then if the learner claps their hands again, they'd remove it again. Well, we might do this and we see maybe there's a couple of times that our learner claps their hands in the demand condition, but they clapped it, let's say, 20 times during the attention condition and only two times during the demand condition and zero times in the play condition and zero times in the alone condition. Okay, um, now we're going to run all of those again. You, you want to mix them up so you're not always going in the exact same order each time. Um, but then what you're able to do after a couple of repeated presentations of each condition is look for patterns. Um, so I'm gonna scroll down. Here's all the descriptions of those. Um, there are other types of conditions that people can run, and I'm gonna come back to those real fast, but I wanna show you what the data might look like. So in this case, we have, here's our attention, here's our escape condition, here's our alone condition, here's our play condition. Alone and play, it occurred zero times. Um, during the escape condition, it occurred, looks like maybe five times, four times, three times there. And during the attention condition, here we have like 25, 24, 25 times, right? And you connect the ones that are the same function. So you don't just connect them all zigzaggy together. You connect the ones that are the same function. Um, in this particular example, each condition was run three times. Um, the sessions, the conditions are 15 minutes was the standard condition. We'll talk about some of the other variations, but it could be 10 minutes. It might even be five minute conditions. So you could do several of these rapidly back to back and have the end results here, not across 12 days, but in the span of a couple of hours, okay? So these are not per day. You would try and do as many of these on the same day as possible so that other effects like hunger or being tired or feeling sick or anything like that wouldn't play into it, all right? So then if we look at this data, we say, wow, in our conditions, in the attention condition, the behavior, in our case clapping, occurred a lot more often. That means that the consequence delivered in the attention condition is more reinforcing than the consequences in any other condition. So we would say, in this case, the uh, learner's biggest reinforcer for this behavior is attention. So the function of their behavior is attention. Now, we're not going to talk today about what do we do with that. That's the next topic because that's a huge topic in and of itself. But we're just trying to determine what is the function of the individual's behavior? What need is this meeting for the individual? So for this individual, in our example, clapping is meeting the need of recruiting attention in that learner's environment. Wonderful. Now we know. All right, so to come back up here and talk about other conditions, now that you understand the idea, the, the premise behind functional analysis, you can create literally any condition that you want. Um, the goal is that you would provide uh, you would set up an opportunity cr to create the opportunity or, or maybe even attempting to evoke the likelihood that that behavior, that overly adapted behavior is going to occur. And you're going to then deliver the consequence that you think is a reinforcer for that behavior. 
So we're just trying to create a lot of little opportunities real fast where we're going to reinforce the behavior with what we think is the reinforcer. And we're gonna count how many times that behavior occurs to confirm our hypothesis. Yes, this is the reinforcer. Now, in order for it to be an experiment, you always have to have a control condition, but you should only run the other conditions as it makes sense for your learner. If I have no reason through my interviews and my direct observations, if I have no reason to think that escape from a demand is a possible function, don't run it. Don't run that condition. If I have um, no reason to think that the learner is engaging in this behavior um, when they are alone or when they're being ignored, um, then don't run that condition, right? Only run the conditions that you think are possible reinforcers for your learner, um, which is why we do the indirect and the direct to determine what we should be testing. At minimum, if you do a functional analysis, you should have your test condition and your control condition. And this will still prove your hypothesis correct or incorrect um, because your control condition, the behavior should never occur because you're already providing what you think is the reinforcer. And in the test condition, the behavior should occur a lot because you are providing the reinforcer only contingent upon them engaging in the behavior. So you could have a situation where you run five minutes um, where they have everything in the world they could want or whatever you think it is that they want. And then five minutes where you only deliver that thing when they engage in the specific behavior. And then you go back and forth a couple of times and then you get a graph that looks like when we're in the control condition, it doesn't occur. And when we're in the blah, blah, blah condition, it occurs. Therefore, blah, blah, blah is the reinforcer. So there are some uh, conditions that have been run. Tangible um, would be very much like the attention condition, except instead of the adult delivering attention, they would be giving them access to a particular item. Diverted attention is very similar, except that instead of just ignoring the individual, the um, implementer would be engaged with someone else, like either talking to someone else in the room or talking on the phone so that it's uh, because maybe for that individual, it's less about having undivided having attention and more about i don't want for example with like little kids i don't want mom talking to somebody else <laughs> i want mom available for me whenever i want mom um so that might be a diverted attention um one that is similar to a demand condition would be a social avoidance so instead of the demand being like an academic task or a chore or something like that the demand is just being around other people and having people come and try and interact or try and talk with them and try and engage. And then if they engage in the uh, overly adaptive behavior, then those people move away and they leave them alone for a little bit of time. Um, that would be what a social avoidance. But these are just examples. Like I said, literally any potential reinforcer could be set up in a functional analysis to test it. So we've looked at our graph. Now, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the uh, expansions to the sort of traditional functional analysis methodology? So time constraints. We want to test these things, but just like with our direct observation, we don't want to run it out so long um, for a couple of reasons. One, during that time, our individual is still not getting their needs met by the environment. So the longer it takes us to figure out what needs they have, the longer the individual is going without their needs being met. Another thing is that in the experiment process, in the functional analysis, we are reinforcing the 
overly adapted behavior. So what we don't want to do is to create too strong of a pattern of this is the most effective way to get your needs met um, in the environment. We don't want to run and reinforce uh, that so many times that then the learner thinks that is the best way to get their needs met. So we want to keep um, the functional analysis very short if possible. Um, so the original uh, time constraints, um, each condition is generally run for 10 minutes and then they're repeated until each one is stable. However, there have been some um, variations that have been tested. Uh, there's the brief functional analysis where sessions were run at five minutes instead of 10 minutes. Um, and that worked, the, the data was similar. There's the single function test, which I mentioned, where you just do the control and the proposed hypothesis. So you can just uh, alternate those rapidly. Um, there might be an extended alone or no interaction um, condition to allow for um, the uh, behavior to possibly decrease the longer it has been um, with uh, without anyone attending to it or, or responding to it. Now, that doesn't mean that you leave an individual alone or ignore them for a long time. That just means that you would run multiple of those sessions, um, but with breaks in between. Okay, so we're not putting people in rooms and ignoring them for two hours. We're doing like 10 minutes, take a break, 10 minutes, take a break, 10 minutes, take a break, something like that. Um, and that's only if you think that that is a possible reinforcer, that that automatic function is a possible reinforcer for your individual. Um, there are also setting constraints. Um, again, traditionally, um, the uh, the functional analysis might be conducted in sort of a um, lab clinic type workspace with people watching through the, the two-way mirrors or whatever. Um, and that is not always feasible. Plus bringing an individual into that environment might produce different responding than in their natural environment. However, there have been, um, uh, there has been research done to show that functional analyses can be implemented in more natural environments, can be conducted in classrooms or in homes, and that um, the person implementing could be a parent or caregiver or a, a teacher um, with an sufficient coaching from a behavior analyst or somebody trained to do the FA. So there are ways to conduct FAs in the natural environment. Um, one other concern that comes up is what about high risk behavior? What if my concern is that an individual, the overly adapted behavior, is that an individual is hitting their head? I don't want to let someone hit their head multiple times in a session just to prove what the what the reinforcer is, okay? So there are a few different ways you could do that. You could look at um, precursor behaviors. So what does the individual typically do before they engage in the head hitting? Maybe they engage in some rocking first. Maybe they engage in some specific vocalizations first. Then maybe we could target those instead of the head hitting and respond when the rocking starts or respond when the vocalizations start. That are often followed by head hitting, but we're going to reinforce before it goes to head hitting. Therefore, the learner doesn't need to hit their head. Um, another alternative uh, when you're working with high risk behavior might be the latency functional analysis. So with the latency functional analysis, then you are not going to do the frequency. You're not going to count how many times the behavior occurred. You're going to measure how long from the start of the condition till the individual engaged in that behavior. And then you're going to just end the whole session, right? You're going to reinforce in the whole session. And what you would see is a shorter latency for um, reinforcers or functions that are more powerful 
longer latency for reinforcers or functions that are not uh, maintaining that behavior. So assignment, <laughs> um, describe the progression of an FBA to identify the function of behavior. So what do we do first, indirect? What do we do second, direct? What do we do third, the functional analysis? Conduct a functional assessment interview with at least two people regarding one overly adapted behavior. I think this is very helpful for people to practice. And this is just an interview and you're not gonna be intervening and you're not gonna be doing an FA. So it's good practice. Find somebody that has a behavior that, um, gen that you wanna know what the reason is, right? It could be a behavior that um, someone thinks needs to decrease. Um, oftentimes when we talk about overly adaptive behavior, we are talking about behaviors that need to decrease at least in a specific situation or setting um, and, and teaching the learner uh, another way to meet their need. Um, but interview two people about that behavior. Um, I've had some trainees that interview, you know, housemates, roommates, uh, partners about uh, overly adapted behavior that their pet engages in, such as you know, clawing the furniture or having toileting accidents or barking or whatever, right? Interview a few people about it and then um, and, and go through one of these uh, functional assessment interviews. And like I said, you can Google and find a lot of different examples. You could come up with your own questions. Um, but the idea is to try to get an idea from this person's perspective why that behavior is occurring. After you do that, look at your data and say, okay, I think that the learner is engaging in this behavior to meet this need. Then Step four, observe the behavior occurring. Collect direct observation data on that behavior. Take some ABC data. What happens before? What happens during? What happens after? Look for patterns. Then step five, check your hypothesis. Revise your hypothesis. Change your hypothesis if necessary. And then step six, describe how you would, but don't do it, how you would conduct a functional analysis on the behavior to prove or disprove your hypothesis. Don't do the FA. Functional analyses should only be done with supports and under the appropriate supervision. I have been in the field for quite a while now and I have never done an FA by myself. I always bring in other people to bounce ideas off of, to help plan the FA or to help run the FA. But you can describe how you would test it. What would you do? What um, functional analysis would you set up to confirm your hypothesis? All right, so that is all for this topic. Next topic, we'll be talking about what do we do once we know the functions of behavior. Um, if you would like to, please subscribe so that you will know when that next video comes up. And thank you so much.